to uh, hmm, 70, uh, 1970, um, and uh, that's kind of when everything started. I mean, it actually started then. Uh, the, 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 the overview of everything uh, I'll keep reiterating is, um, is that now we're, we're using the word biotexture instead of architecture. Uh, for two reasons. One uh, is because uh, they took my license and wouldn't let me use the word architecture, architect, in this state. Um, and the other is that um, architecture is not really living up to what, to the challenge of what of today. So we need we need a profession that uh, names what needs to be done. And so the, our definition of biotechnology is achieving sustenance through encounter of earth phenomena. Earth phenomena is wind, rain, sun, condensation. Uh, some of these get away from us, like all of it, all of it, you know. We've had windmills blow apart. We've had rain coming into the living room. We've had sun frying eggs on the kitchen table, melting typewriters. Uh, we've obviously fallen off roofs. We've had condensation doing bad things, and on and on and on. Uh, but all of these phenomena of the planet are what we're trying to not harness by any means. That's uh, an arrogant phrase, uh, word. We're trying to encounter them to ride into the future on, you know, to, to, uh, to encounter <coughs> is a much better word than, than harness. So, and we're succeeding now in, in a lot of levels. We haven't got much going with lightning and rainbows yet, but we're still playing. <laughs> uh, uh, that's our pyramid out at the uh, castle compound uh, with, uh, during a meteor shower, actually. That's real. Uh, that had a lot to do with the history. Um, this, I'm showing you first a few buildings that just show you where Earth ships have been, are in the last decade, and then the history is where they came from. This building is engulfed now in the Hyde building over there, uh, but it was kind of a signature building that showed, you know, it can be very sculptural and still do all of these things. Uh, there are some uh, points here that I'll make um, as we go into the history. Uh, native peoples and plants and animals have existed for many centuries and have not had a significant effect on the Earth's ability to support humans. It's only, it's only us <laughs> that started screwing things up. These creatures encountered Earth phenomena for sustenance. Uh, they all did it, you know. Uh, trees do it, you know. Uh, plants do it, animals do it. Uh, these creatures, trees and plants, didn't have, you know, they didn't have, a, they don't have a, an economy and they didn't have garbage. Those are two things. Just think back in the history before humans. Economy? Well, what the hell was it? Garbage? What the hell was it? It wasn't, they weren't even words. Um, and so, uh, modern developed people have only been around us for a couple hundred years, uh, modern developed people, and we've already just trashed everything. You know, in 200 years, millennia, everything goes on before us. We get here and trash it in 200 years. Uh, that says a lot for us. Uh, we have economy and garbage. Those are two of the major differences between us and what plants and animals do. So I'm, I'm looking at economy and garbage as being the problems. Uh, it, you know, maybe they're not the only problems, but they certainly are. We do everything based on an economy, and we produce garbage, and they're the ingredients that have cost modern humans to adversely affect the Earth's ability to support human life. Um, this modern world has a system to sustain an economy. And that economy is supposed to sustain people, and it doesn't. So you know, we are all well aware of that fact. The economy is just some creature that we all kind of worship, basically, and are afraid of. All the politicians are just trying to feed the economy. I'm like, like when we were in Haiti, uh, Clinton was over there at the same time, talk, making talks. He was saying he was trying to grow an economy in Haiti. 
And here we're over there with these people. They just want water and shelter and a place to shit. And he's trying to grow an economy. I mean, what is he doing? So uh, a greater world, in my opinion, would have a system to sustain people. And the sustenance of people out of that would uh, grow a, a little bit of an economy. Uh, an, insignificant, an insignificant economy is what I call it at this point. Um, real economy is the result, not the means, of sustaining people. And again, these are all buildings that do this uh, all over the world. The modern world economy produces garbage. A greater world based on sustenance for people would transform and, and consume garbage, much like happens in the forest. You know, leaf, tree leaves are dropped and become compost and consumed in the soil. You know, there's no you know, there's no Milky Way wrappers falling off the trees and things like that. Uh, everything in nature goes back to nature, it is nature. We somehow are separated. A, a lot of that could have to do with a, a, a lot different discussion than this right now, but people are, were delivered here from another galaxy. And uh, that's why we're so foreign to this planet. Garbage is the result of economy. Sustain the people, and you'll transcend economy. If, if everybody is sustained through encounter with natural phenomenon, they don't really need an economy. You know, we're getting heat, we're getting food, uh, we're getting water. Uh, the economy becomes something you want to use to get a new motorcycle, or, you know, something like that. But to stay alive on the planet, should, it shouldn't be subject to economy. So I'm saying transcend the economy, and you'll transform or eliminate the concept of garbage. And it all results in sustenance for the people. Provide comfortable shelter, water, electricity, food, sanitation for all people. That's, that's the thing that would transcend all of the bullshit that's going on now. So I'm saying transcend the economy, transform garbage. That building right there is in Jamaica, transforming garbage into building material. <coughs> and have a life. So that's kind of our overview of what we're trying to do. All of the buildings I just showed you are in recent history of where it has evolved to. Uh, there are specifics now that we'll go into in, in future classes. Uh, but these are just these buildings that address these issues I'm talking about. And it's all about decentralization. Centralization is you make a nuclear power plant and you hook everybody up to it and you destroy the planet in the process, have a bunch of wires go into houses, everybody's dependent, whoever owns a nuclear power plant, everybody's uh, subject to them. Uh, we're talking decentralization where every home is its own power plant, is its own water plant, is its own sewage plant, cellular. Cellular things are much stronger because like when you when you say somebody's got cancer, cancer's considered to be a virus. Somebody's got cancer, you can't go in and knock out the heart or the brain of the cancer. Because cancer's millions of cells and each cell is independent. You've got to burn out with chemo or whatever every single cell. You know, when, uh, when uh, people or countries are at war, they say, let's knock out their water and we'll have them on their knees. Uh, let's knock out their power and we'll have them on their knees. Well, what if every house has its own power and, uh, water and power? <coughs> then we're not looking, we're looking at strength. We're looking at how do you knock these people out. You have to kill every single one of them, blow up every single house. And so when every home is its own everything, the people are empowered. They're not subject to the owners of the nuclear power plant or the politicians who control the power plant or whatever. So it brings us to, again, what we are dealing with in this academy and in the world. It's these six points, um, building with garbage, recycled materials, uh, thermal solar heating and cooling, solar and wind electricity, water harvesting, contained sewage treatment, and food production. Every city, every country is dealing with those issues. We're dealing with them on our own for our own benefit so that we don't have to deal with the politics and the economy uh, and, you know, the religions are even wrapped up in that, too. So, how did we get here, and, and why, and so on? That's the history. Um, 
And the history is going to show you where, you know, the buildings that you guys are in. The history is going to show you where they came from and how they got started. And uh, uh, what we're going to do to retrofit them. So this is a, in a beer can dome out in the desert uh, many years ago. Uh, that chair still exists. I found it in the dump. And I posted it in uh, burgundy velvet, like the seats of my Mercedes. And uh, set out there and thought. So the, it all started with this beer can building block. Uh, uh, basically, that came from um, two, a, a newscast that had... Uh, uh, a guy on the road taking photographs and video footage of, of beer cans, these old steel beer cans. This is before the aluminum cans. This is how long ago this was, uh, before recycling was even a word. Um, they, they were throwing them all over the streets and highways and parks and everything. And they, this guy did a news show saying, you know, look at what's happening. We're going to have a garbage problem in the future on this planet. Well, of course we do. And on the same news show, there was another guy talking about clear-cutting timber in the Northwest. And he said, in the future, we're going to have an oxygen problem because we're cutting down too many trees. And then this is in the 70s. And we're early 70s, 70. And also, we're going to have housing crisis because housing is going to be too expensive because we're cutting down all our wood. And we're going to have erosion and all kinds of other things. All that has come true. And so those... That newscast, which was all in one newscast, actually, I'm fresh out of architectural school. The next thing I know, I'm trying to make a building block out of beer cans, killing two birds with one stone, trying to build houses out of something plentiful on this planet other than trees, and trying to get rid of cans because we want to get rid of them, trying to integrate them back into the world. So we made can building blocks, and it wasn't just a six-pack. It had all the aluminum foil and a flattened can and, and it was rough here to receive the mortar and you know I patented it. I got a patent on it believe it or not and uh, uh, what good's a patent you know. Uh, we don't patent anything anymore. We want people to use it. This is the building though that uh, made a model of it. I forget how it happened. I, I believe I wrote the can companies and said, you know, I'm trying to do something with the product that you're making on this planet and it's getting thrown all over the place. Uh, and I'm a kid. I'm like 22 or something. Uh, that's not me. That's a guy that worked for me. That's the house we built out of the beer can building blocks. I went to, uh, I, so I put it out there in a letter, I believe, and, I, and all of the can companies, they have a union. Continental Can, National Can, Heakin Can, I think most of them are still in existence, they all got together and got back to me and said, hey, dude, come to Chicago. So uh, they put me on a plane. I go to the Hancock building. Halfway up, I'm sitting around a table with a bunch of lawyers in a table as big as this room. And they said, we, we're going to pay you to do the drawings for this building. And we're going to finance it. And I'm like 22 years old. Hell, yeah, this is great. So I come back. I get a bank loan for $11,000. That's what this building cost. And uh, started building the building. This guy, Ed Paul, he's dead now. But he helped me build it and the other guy. And the three of us built the building. And the, somehow the press got hold of it. And this guy's picture was in pretty much every newspaper in the world, laying beer cans. It was kooky. I mean, it, was, it wasn't there for any ecological reason. Ecolo ecology wasn't even talked about. Recycling wasn't talked about. It was just a freak in the mesa building a building out of garbage is what it really was. There's the freak. Um, <laughs> all over the world it went. I mean, every single newspaper. And that's, that's, but it wasn't presented as something valid. It was presented as a freak. Uh, but it built. We built it out of the building blocks, patented building blocks. Um, that's me laying beer cans on the front page of the Denver Post right below uh, Nixon being impeached. And uh, they called me an architect. I was still taking my tests. I wasn't an architect yet. And I told him that. I told the, the, the reporter that. He printed it up and called me an architect. New Mexico, this is in 70 or 2, 72, something like that, just to show you how early the troubles began. 
the New Mexico Board of Architects came and chastised me and held up my license for two years because a newspaper called me, an, I allowed a newspaper to call me an architect. So they held up my license for two years. But even worse than that, I go to the bank, I'd gone to the bank to get $11,000 to build this building. I'm a young kid uh, in debt for $11,000, and in those days $11,000 was a lot of money. Uh, what is that, 40 some odd years ago? And uh, Continental Can was supposed to come through with the money, they didn't. And so I write them, and this is before email, I write them a letter, and uh, I get a letter back that uh, there's another ticket waiting for me to come to the Chicago to the Hancock building, meeting with the lawyers. They backed out. I sat around the big table again. The lawyers made their case. They said, first of all, there is no can layers union. So how can you build with this without a union? There's a block layers union, there's a brick layers union, but there's no can layers union. We can't, we can't do that. And plus, this is made as a, to store food and water and beverage in. It's not made to, to build buildings out of, and we'll get sued. So therefore, we can't do it. And I said, well, I've already got, borrowed the money based on your word. And they, sorry. So they shipped me back, and I go to a lawyer, and uh, the lawyer uh, says, well, I can, I can embarrass them probably and get you your 11 grand. It'll take, you know, half of it for me to do that. I'll get 5,500 back. And he said, well, what are you building this house for? And I said, 11 grand. He said, I'll buy the house. So the lawyer saw, you know, just like lawyers do, he saw, you know, money. He saw he could get a house for 11 grand, and he turned around and sold it for 50 grand or something like that. So I got fucked by the lawyer and the can company. So, um, but that's how it starts. And it, that's the beginning. That's the beginning of horse shit. And it's kept going. So it's just, that's the way it is in the real world, in the business world, in the world world at large. That's why... You know, we're looking at trying to escape to the stars or whatever. Uh, so this is the first beer can building, and this is the way it looks today. It's still standing. It's a, it's a building, they call it the Thumb House. It was the very beginning of solar. This is facing south, and, you know, and, and like I say, uh, I built it for 11 grand, and he sold it for 50-ish. But then we realized that the... Beer can itself is a brick. We don't need to make a brick. It's a brick. They, they, this is a, called a sandwich wall. These, are, in, in the architectural world, these are bricks and bricks and some flimsy piece of insulation. Well, now it's very serious how much insulation we put there. But uh, so this, we've developed this panel wall made of cans. Again, we already know from experience that they're not going to allow cans to be a structural thing. So we make uh, wood or concrete post and beam, and the state and the authorities are okay with that. This just becomes a panel. Well, you can make your panel out of anything you want. So they permitted it and allowed it. And so we built the first concrete post and beam. This guy's dead, too. He crashed in a hand glider situation. Um, but even then, people, it, there was newspapers drifting by and magazines, even back then just because a freak was using garbage to build with. And it got around, uh, and publicity started. Uh, not appropriate publicity, but they say there's no such thing as bad publicity. I mean, I, I lived here. I built this to live in. You're, some of you are living in this one right now. Uh, this is how it went together. It's panels, and the first use of bottles for a stairway, and, uh, and the pyramid. And the, the coffer up on top of the pyramid, I used to go up on there, climb up a rope, and strap myself in up there for the full moon. Totally baked a hole in the back of my head, and uh, so you got what you got now. Uh, <laughs> this is inside the other apartment that some of you are living in, which is part of that place. The rail. I moved in here. It was a railroad tie barn full of bowling pins and a tractor and all kinds of stuff. And this is a tuna can chandelier. Uh, and, you know, we lived in there, wood heat. Uh, you could see, in those days, you could see daylight through the railroad tie walls. And, uh, but this is the space that, this is another space that 
I lived in, that some of you are living in, and where a lot of things happen. Uh, there it is again. Uh, and you know, I had a, I had a family. This was, uh, I was already into wife number two, who had three kids, and um, so we had lived in the whole damn building, and I had an office there, and uh, it was great. There's the tuna can chandelier. They didn't go very far. Uh, bottle chandelier. Uh, candle chandelier. Pipe hands. Uh, that was a place where we sifted. Um, the bottle stairway. All of these things started in that building. It was a compound. Um, I didn't even have a permit, I don't think. Uh, it was just early 70s, mid 70s, just start building. You can't do that today. But so we, you can see what we were doing there. We're playing with beer cans as a brick, bottles as a brick, uh, went on to play with tires, playing with solar, and playing with pyramids. We're playing with phenomena of the planet, basically, trying to find out stuff. And so it, was, it became a compound uh, that my stepson lives in now in that part of the building. That was my office at the time. There's the coffer on top of the pyramid, and there's the rope coming down. So I would go out there on that little deck, climb up the rope, strap myself in the coffer, and even in the winter, and uh, when the moon, it's facing south, so the moon would come up in the east and go over there, and when the moon would get straight in front of it, it would be pretty intense, it, enough to definitely hollow out the inside of your head and see things like that. <coughs> So that's the compound that we're now retrofitting. These are sketches for retrofitting. It's, it's become partially that. Uh, we're still retrofitting. I mean, I mean, some of this stuff, when you retrofit it, by the time you retrofit it, well, it's the, you find out more stuff that needs to be done. Now, this is a point that possibly strapping myself into the top of the pyramid helped me see. But this is where we are. This is, this is the path of humanity that we're on right now. And it's leading to a bummer. Destruction, whatever. Everybody kind of agrees that we're headed for some bad shit. Mm -hmm. um, and it's our path where we're headed. So like, you know, with our existing dogma, our existing uh, belief system, everything we've got <coughs> that is in our heads is what is reality, is headed for that. And so I'm like, well, I don't want to go there. So I'm saying, why are we limited to a path? I mean, there's the bummer out there for sure, and our pathway of our dogma and our belief system heads to it, but why do we have to go that way? Why don't we go over here? Or over here? There's a million different ways to go. Any place, but the way we're going is right. That's the thing. The way we're going is wrong. And it's not like pick another path. It's pick any other path. We've got a million choices of a better way to live on this planet. We happen to be talking about one. It encompasses a lot of things. But there is no... We, why? Just ask yourself, why are we limited to that highway? I mean, that's what's really out there. And, it's, and that's just two dimensions. I'm talking about, really now, all kinds of dimensions. Up, down, and whatever, you know. This is keeping it simple. So we can go anywhere, and that's what we're doing. And that's how we're getting there. Um, and uh, we'll go into this a little later. Um, so, even back then, the, I'm a graduate of the University of Cincinnati, and word's getting back there that I've gone crazy out in the Mesa, and building <coughs> houses out of garbage, and students start coming. And this is, uh, their, you know, you, you think, <laughs> you've got it bad living in some of these old buildings. These people built their own building, these students, and it wasn't that bad. They, you know, they, they just, they took two or three days and got a bunch of old tires with spiders in them and snakes and everything else and wired them together, put plastic over it, put their beds on the floor and they loved it. And we'd sit in there and play music and burdock growing out of the ground and you can eat burdock. And uh, so they built their own, which actually is not a bad thing. Uh, but they were intense until then. We never, we never up until just uh, six or so years ago, we didn't want to say no to people, but we didn't have any accommodations for them, so we just let people come. And they did whatever. They camped. They, you know, they did all kinds of stuff. Uh, this is my son's bed made of old wooden coke crates. 
we were in that frame of mind. There he is helping me build it. Um, and walls made of beer cans, uh, bottle walls. And this is using the building blocks and the post and beam technique to make the building. We're, I'm starting to, at least in these days, this is still late 70s maybe, um, get into, I realized that, okay, it, it can't, you know, it can't look like this if the real world is going to accept it. You know, they're just saying, okay, there's a bunch of hippies, blah, 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 which still they think today. But, so I tried to make it kind of southwestern looking. And this thing got a permit. That's a real life building permit. <laughs> and built it for a couple, a real client. They kind of picked up on the technique, added, you know, doubled or tripled the square footage, and promptly got a divorce and sold it. Uh, and this is the can scene was big then. So we move into tires. This, this uh, shell never got finished. It's still out there to the west of you guys that are standing in the castle compound. Uh, this is Oscar, one of the guys that worked with me. And uh, I gave him the piece of land and he, he started building this and never finished. Uh, in those days, it was, there's all kinds of houses and mobile homes and junk out there now. There was nothing out there then but rattlesnakes and tarantulas. And it got a little lonely for him, I think. So in town, I still have the compound in town. All of this is going on all at the same time. Uh, this is the Hobbit House. Some of you are staying in the Hobbit House. This is before we started pounding tires. We built a few buildings. These tires are just stuffed. They're just filled with dirt and stuffed. And it's still standing. What? I don't know how many years later. 30 years later. Uh, it's still standing, it's still being used, some of you are living in it. And uh, uh, it was built by students, uh, it cost $3,500 to build. Um, and what the, the whole tire pounding thing, see, there's one of the students, he's an architect in Santa Fe now. Um, but students built it, with, we built it for $3,500, um, it, uh, it's a, it was, of course, done without a permit, and but it was the beginning of, we're really, really further into solar. You know, we went up the mountains ourselves and got the trees and the logs and, and getting cans. Now we're dealing with aluminum cans. And uh, uh, beginning of students coming. I, uh, this is the girlfriend of one of the guys that worked with me. That's what it used to look like. Um, they call it the Hobbit House. Now it's all plastered and everything. There's a nostalgic picture of it in the old days. Um, and uh, I built it for a hippie woman who I saw living in a shack with three kids. And uh, so I built this for her, which was a little bit warmer than her shack with her three kids. Turned out she's a millionaire and I married her. I married her before. I found out she was a me. I thought I was marrying a hippie, and I turned out to be an oil baroness. Um, um, you know. uh, so there it is today, and it's still being used, and we're evolving it. Um, and that's what the canyon place, the, the canyon compound looks like in the summertime. It turns green. It's got an apple orchard. It's got an apple press. I mean, it's a paradise there. Uh, there's inside the building in the old days. Uh, there it is in the winter, not too long ago. Uh, uh, there's another bathroom for somebody made out of the old steel cans. There's the first tire building, tire room. The, the Hobbit House, the first tire building. This is an add-on. Again, we're stuffing tires. Now, the history of, of tire pounding, you're going to go out there, what, tomorrow, I believe, and lay out a building, a, a top-of-the-line global model ownership, and you're going to be pounding tires. Well, in the old days, we stuffed the tires. And then here, how, it, how it happened was um, uh, I got hooked up with a whole gay community of women. I don't really know how. Uh, I guess, really, I was making a lecture in Austin, Texas, and, uh, and they, their head woman sent somebody to see me to say they wanted to finance this work for me. And, they wanted to, and I'm like... No, uh, I don't want anybody to finance it because then you're going to want to tell me what to do. So I said no. They came back 
and asked again. I said, no again. They came back a third time and said, look, we'll give you a hundred grand a year. And this is in 70s, late 70s or something like that. That's a lot of money. hundred grand a year, do with it whatever you want. And we won't tell you what to do or anything. And we'll just own the building that you build in the, in the end and you'll get to further your research. And I said, okay. I did it. And so they actually got some of them and they were replicating everything I was doing. They were replicating it. And what I was getting at there was two stories in one here. One is uh, they, the money came to me in $20,000 chunks from Switzerland, Swiss bank. So I'm like, what is really going on here? <laughs> Turns out that the money, what the, the, the head honcho gay woman, uh, and I liked them all. We were all, we made, we played music and everything. I was just like, uh, you know, I was in. Um, and she had been married to a doctor, a genius, and they got a divorce. But they had learned to make blotter acid when they were together. And she was continuing to do it. He wanted out because he didn't want to lose his license. So Earthship's were funded in the very beginning by Mickey Mouse blotter acid. <laughs> being, the money being laundered through a Swiss bank for three years and coming to us in 20 grand chunks. And so that's how it started. So they're replicating the building that we're building. So they replicated this. And this is kind of stuffed tires. And what uh, they did, the girls, you know, this is with, built with the guys. And then the girls are doing theirs. And they were stuffing it in with little mallets, and their tires were a little more tight or packed than ours. And we're going, well, we can't have that. So the next one we did, we started beating it in with sledgehammers. So that's how, that's how it got to be such a bomber thing. I didn't just think it up. I started stuffing tires with dirt, and then the girls started pushing it in with hammers, and then we started beating it in with sledgehammers. It's just like you, you're out there doing stuff, and stuff happens to cause it to evolve. That's the point there, is we're out there doing stuff that's not even correct, or it's awkward, or, or whatever, too expensive, or too ugly, or whatever. You're just doing it. I mean, so the point I'm making there is don't be afraid to do anything. However weird it looks, or however poorly it functions, um, do it, and the process of doing it will make it so you can do it better. You'll, you'll learn things, you'll see things. And that has to do with the structures and the systems and the method of getting it done in Stockholm or wherever. Just do it. Just do it. Go to jail. Who cares? You know, lose your license. Who cares? Uh, I mean, I used to, when a building inspector would come to a job, I used to run for the hills. You know, because we never had permits. And, but I, I got wise with that, too. I used to go down then and report to them everything we were doing. And they were cool about it. They said, Reynolds, somebody's got to do this. I'm glad that you're doing it. And uh, then... Part of the history of everything is all those guys within a couple of years. I had a rapport with all kinds of inspectors and, and engineers and whatever at the state level. And I was telling them all what I was doing. And they were totally glad that somebody in New Mexico was thinking of the future and blah, blah, blah. Well, all within, uh, I wonder if this water's been here very long. Uh, um, all within a couple years' time, these guys, all, they were all, you know, in their 50s and whatever, 60s. Uh, they died or had cardiac arrests or brain tumors or whatever. My whole group of people that were allowing me to do this legally at the state level kind of disappeared from the planet within two or three years. Some all new young guys come along and, you know... Uh, with a hair up their ass and, you know, and going by the book. And they said, Reynolds, you're, you're breaking every rule in the book here. And I said, well, Fred Navarra has said I could do this. I've even got a letter from him. They said, he's dead. He doesn't work here anymore. And you're breaking every raw rule in the book. And we're going to take your license. You know, so that's kind of how all of that happened. There's more to it than that. But um, uh, I was getting permission verbally and even in some letters uh, of approval of doing this. And they died, and I'm left holding the bag. And, yeah, I was in a shh of trouble. 
And this is a beer can house built on a tire foundation, uh, early solar. And the pickle jars there and the bottles in the front are all full of water. And the walls are full of water. These are cans full of water. We ordered, we got into the physics of it, that uh, thermal mass, which is in water is a very dense thermal mass, holds temperature. So I had a brewery in Tucson can me some water in aluminum cans without pop tops. And I made uh, a house that way. Well, that was successful. It's still standing. It's great. Then this house, these, pe uh, these people wanted one just like it or similar to it. So I ordered another load of cans from uh, Tucson. And these came in a big 18-wheeler. Uh, and I'll tell you more about them under thermal mass uh, when I talk about that, I guess, uh, this afternoon. Maybe. Uh, but they came with pop tops. Screw up. They, they didn't put this regular lid, I mean the sealed lids, they came with pop tops. So in this house, every, you know, week or so, you hear in the wall. It's the cans losing their shit, you know, from the pop tops. And so the water is slowly draining out. Uh, newspapers were following it all the way along and uh, details. And so then, so we're, you know, you're seeing tires being evolved, you're seeing cans being evolved, you're seeing how funding happened in the early days. Now it's just bank loans. You know, bank loan after bank loan after bank loan keeps us floating. Um, the bank has treated us good for over 40 years. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a little bit more legitimate than Mickey Mouse bladder acid. And the, um, so we take this technology, we're learning stuff. We're learning how to make warm buildings. So we uh, aren't making any money off of, you know, these kind of buildings, though. Uh, they're, we're, we're just thrilled that somebody wants to fund them for themselves. So to, to make money, I would build FHA, Farmers Home Association, uh, buildings, frame cracker boxes, because I could slam them up and sell them, and people would buy them, and they were approved, and no nonsense. Well, I got to be good at it, and uh, the Farmers Home Administration people liked me, and I was known to be building decent buildings, and so I started putting windows on the south side. And then, I, then the next year, I put all windows on the south side. Then the next year, I started burying them, putting windows on the south side, and we called them Volk's homes, people's houses. And, uh, and then to, to, to make it even more, you know, I guess I've always kind of pushed the limits of things. Turns out to get one of these homes, all you have to do is make less than 14 grand a year. And in those days, lots of people did. People on my crew made less than 14 grand a year. Hell, I made less than 14 grand a year. And they would, they would subsidize you to build one an FHA home. Uh, and your payments, there's no down payment, and your payments were 120 bucks a month. And so that's like a screaming deal. So what I did is took people on my crew, because I had a rapport with FHA, took them down to FHA headquarters, had FHA give them a loan to pay me, to pay them, to build a house for them. It was like a great scam. You know, the money just went back and forth like a ping pong ball, and we're building a solar house, because now they're, we've evolved it into this. Well, a whole team came out from Washington, saw this house, and shut us down. Um, but these were great houses. They're Volks homes. They still exist out there below the castle area in the Mesa. And, uh, and then I, I also built, uh, I was in, uh, in uh, every once in a while I'd quit doing all this because it just got too crazy and uh, play rock and roll music in a band. And so I made one of these for my bass player. I made one for my lead guitar player. I had the whole band housed in houses for $120 a month. But anyway, FHA shot us down. Come, they came back a few years later when, when they got aware of solar and, and everything and asked me to start up again, and I didn't want any part of it. They're still asking me to, to get into government housing, and I, I don't want any part of any government. Uh, this is an early concrete post and beam aluminum can house. Again, we're thrilled that somebody wants to invest their money to build a thing like this made out of garbage, whatever you want to call it. And uh, this we built for 25 grand. He sold it for 65. It's early solar, but it's it's great because it uh, there's no maintenance inside or out. 
No plaster. It's cans outside, cans inside. Um, we built a dome out in the Mesa. It's out there by the Castle Compound. I don't know how, but Germans found out about it. Put it on one of their magazines and uh, books. And uh, then there was a travel magazine that did it. And, and I mean, I was living in that one with the pyramid in, in the Canyon Compound and going out in the desert and doing this. I went out to take a leak one morning early, and there's a, a, a photographer and crew out there, you know, <laughs> wanting to photograph me and interview me. Uh, needless to say, I gave them what for, but this is that dome being built out in the Mesa. Uh, nothing around, nothing is out there. I would just go out there with the oil baroness, who actually was running away from her riches and wanted to live like this. So her and I built this dome out there in the Mesa and uh, getting struck by lightning and, uh, and running away rattlesnakes. And it's insulated, double cam dome, insulated, uh, worked great. It's all, I mean, that the beauty of this, and I talk about it in one of the books, is this is one material and one technique builds a whole building, you know. I mean, that's like wasps, you know, they just gather mud and shape it and, and make a home. The, well, this worked. Uh, I, will, I don't do these much today anymore because of earthquake. I mean, all the old domes from medieval times are done this way, and you know, most of them have made it. But um, I, we do all of our domes and vaults with steel now with a potato chip, ferro cement situation, which you'll see. Um, it is much more stable in terms of earthquakes than something like this. But the beauty of this was aluminum cans and cement will make your entire home. And we did it. That's the way the Mesa looked. There's the old truck still sitting out there that uh, built this company. Jesus truck, it's called. It's called Jesus. Uh, there we are building it. Topless. It was fun. <laughs> there's the Germans that came and messed with me while I was taking a leak outside my house in the morning. And they went out there and put it on the cover of a travel magazine. Uh, and I moved out there and uh, lived in it, and that and the turbine house. And then below it, this is the Mickey Mouse Acid first house. And uh, that was the one, I'll get into more of that, where they, we fried a typewriter on a kitchen table from solar gain, out of control. Um, bottle work, tire work, t pounded tires like the girls taught us. And the crew of the early Rolar buildings, we call these the Rolar. Rolar is a part of a magic square. It, it, it says the same thing this way, and it says the same thing this way, it says the same thing this way, and it says the same thing this way. It's, it's, it's magic. Uh, so we made, named a little company. We named their Mickey Mouse Acid Company after it. Um, just early metal details, we do that with... Uh, washing machine parts now. Even in those days, we're starting to produce food. And so we're taking these techniques further, and now we're getting into serious domes of beer cans, tire greenhouse, you know, similar to, similar to where we're at now, but uh, really seriously recycled buildings. And this building is still around. There's the, there's the guy with the Rolar t-shirt, and his name was Buffalo Bob. There's the oil baroness. And there's the girl that helped me build a pyramid uh, that was in a head-on collision with an 18-wheeler and is no longer around. There's the Rolar t-shirt. Uh, uh, but these people were really good at making domes. So we make these three beer can domes. They're buried. Greenhouse on the front of them. You can do anything with cans. This house is still standing and it's beautiful inside. Uh, the... Uh, there's the way the domes close. You didn't need the formwork. Cans are light and amazing. I could take a, a wad of pasty cement and stick one right to the wall vertical. I mean, they're, it's, you're, the, the, what you can do with cans is pretty amazing. And there's, you know, people were saying they're recycling them. That They are, but uh, they're still around everywhere and in every country. Um, this is the house. I mean, it's a nice place. Kids live there. It's a solar Domes, fireplace, it's just, it's beautiful. Kids have the little dome rooms now, the little stove in it. it takes very little to heat these. You, you, you 
put a fire in the stove, but you should just make it out of kindling because by the time the kindling's burnt up, the building's warmer than it needs to be. But it shows you what you can do with cans, and it's amazing. It's unlimited. That picture was in National Geographic. They came out at the, the second, the oil baroness woman I married and divorced her three times. And uh, <coughs> they came out for one of the weddings. Uh, they didn't know it was the wedding. They just wanted to do a piece for National Geographic and ended up, uh, the wedding was in National Geographic. Uh, 1984, or 83 or 84, April. These are uh, vaults, hallway vaults made of cantonary curves. Cantonary curves when you hang a chain like this and that's the curve it makes. It doesn't make a perfect curve, it makes a cantonary curve and it's like an egg, it's stronger. Uh, we used it for the vault and we used it for the dome. That's a cantonary dome, that's one of the strongest domes you could make. And uh, that was at the girls' compound. Then we made a full-on tire house because we're playing with all it. We're playing with evolving the can stuff, evolving the tire stuff, and uh, so uh, we start making just making tire houses. And this is these are this building, believe it or not, is stuffed tires. It's before we really got into pounding them. And that's a real live building permit. And the building was buried. It, it's not. The, a lot of the, this is before I really got smart on, well, I've never really gotten smart, but it's a, it's, the building looked like it landed, and, you know, it's not marketable. I lived in it for a while, and I rented it, and I finally sold it. But, again, I'm learning solar, I'm learning solar hot water, I'm learning thermal mass, I'm learning how to build with tires, uh, I'm trying to figure it out there. Uh, and these are, are, you know, these are the sections and drawings for this building, uh, which did eventually sell. This is kind of cool. The, this is the bathtub, and these are all the water-filled cans, and so they get hot during the day. In the evening, they radiate heat while you took a bath. It was nice. And then I started trying to incorporate the domes into a regular adobe building, but it was a solar adobe, and trying to mix it in. But then at the same time, we'd get somebody like this, uh, a local artist, really thought the idea of building with beer cans was cool, but he wanted his house to look traditionally adobe. So this is what it ended up looking like. This is beer cans. And uh, it just shows you how versatile they can be. Uh, I'll go into this more in the energy lectures, but this is the turbine house out there. Turbine's finally blown apart, but it's spun for 25 years with no maintenance. And uh, this is the one where uh, National Geographic came out and did the uh, article. That's the old turbine house, the old big windmill on top of the castle. We had to take it off because it was about to just rip the whole castle out of the ground. Uh, it made a th tremendous amount of power. There it is out there. That's where, that's where some of you are staying. The castle is right here, they call it. And this is what it was like. Nothing was out here. And uh, this, they call this the grandfather of earth ships because it was doing everything. Solar power, wind power, hot water, food production. I built it for 15 grand. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I, what happened with this building was it was pretty uh, mind changing or whatever because um, I lived in it. I lived, I guinea pigged a lot of them and uh, I lived in it. And I built it out of pocket with some friends. They helped me. And uh, out there in the middle of the desert, I had food. I was eating grasshoppers and rattlesnakes, and pigeons were up here. I'd go up there with a two before and club a pigeon and, and roast it. And uh, so I didn't need money. You know, that's how I got into all these thoughts about economy and money. And, and what's more than that, I, I owned my life. I'd wake up in the morning, I didn't have to work. I had everything. And I started thinking, well, what the hell? What, what if millions of people had this? That would be pretty fantastic. And so that's where the biggest mistake I ever made is coming back to the real world. I could have just stayed out there and been happily ever after. Coming back to the real world and trying to bring this thought back to the real world is when the fun began. This is how we studied out those old buildings. We'd eat the model when it was done. Look how close it looks. I'm talking reality here. <laughs> And there is the turbine building, which was, a lot went on in that building. That was, uh, it's 
one of the guys on the crew who's out of town right now lives in it now. He's let it run down big time. But it used to just sit there and make power. I used to set up in this room up here, and I had a big cable going over to the big windmill, and I was like some kind of mad scientist. I'm sitting there looking at two amp meters pegging out completely in a high wind, and both of these windmills are making power. I mean, it was, it was pretty cool. And that was, in electrical, we'll go into it. We've evolved these vertical axis windmills to what you see out here, still playing with generators on it. But they call it the turbine house. It's been on display in a lot of museums and stuff because it was relative to what the hippies were doing in the 70s after the first energy crisis and whatever. So there's the, the beginning of the big windmill. And we put these up with that old red truck and some leverage and whatever. Put this thing on here. That thing just started in high winds. It literally was going to take off. So, and the first one... Blew, the blades blew all over the mesa. Finally, we got it to stay together. Then it was going to take off. And so there's the compound out there. And it was pretty wild living out there. Just talk about encountering the natural phenomena. You know, you're out there in the sun, the wind. I mean, we are, we are encountering the environment to have a life. And we have a pyramid over here. So you can sort of figure out, uh, not figure out, but try to find out what, oh, what's going on there. And so we, we built the thing, lived in it, uh, and my ex-wife, ex-ex or whatever, uh, had a school bus that we auxiliarated the situation with. Uh, she could go there when she got mad or whatever. And then the pyramid happened, and uh, like I say, nothing else is out there. So this was... This was uh, a frontier. This was, this was a, lot of, a lot of stuff happened out here that, that charged and, and began what we're doing today. And living in it, I mean, when you're living there and taking care of it and everything, it's a, it was a great place to live. Uh, it was the beginning of uh, earthships. This is before we even call them earthships. And so that's the turbine building. There's the National Geographic. I have it in there. There's the wedding day. And there's a lot about that. I can't tell right now. Then there's um, the chicken coop dome. And uh, chickens were happy because they got solar heated and they laid eggs all winter. There's the pit house, which is really an early forerunner of what we call the earth ship. It was just a pit with a row of tires around it. And I lived in it for a couple of years, and it was even better than the turbine house. And, um, and it, you know, showed me that, you know, I'm sitting in there. There's a fireplace, two of them in that building, and they hardly ever got used because the buildings just took, you know, in the sun and stored it in the walls. Pyramid going up, um, again, it's a phenomena. We don't really talk about it too much uh, with the building inspectors and things like that. They just thought there was a cult going on or something. They didn't, know, they didn't know what to think about it. And it's magnetically aligned. There's the cables. It's true 51 point something degrees angle. It's based on the Cheops pyramid. It has travertine marble in the cap and buried a bunch of crystal under the travertine marble. It's got a dome inside. The dome... Between the dome and the, and the can wall is sand, and the sand supports the can wall, and the can wall retains the sand. So it's just whole thing holding itself together. It's a, it's a pretty neat structure. <coughs> and uh, there's the travertine marble cap. We had a sled slide that we got the old red truck on the other side and, and made a ramp to pull the cap up with the truck going further out that way. I mean, this thing was sharp and weighed 500 pounds, and... It was crazy getting it and all of this stuff built. This is the compound that you're staying in now. It's a, there's a lot of history out there. We've had weddings and funerals here. We burned a woman here. We, uh, her, her, she died. She was Beth, the, the woman who I showed you the picture of. She helped me build the pyramid. She had a head-on collision with an 18-wheeler. Uh, her brothers came out from the city and buried her on some land that I had given her over the hill. They didn't know how to dig. They buried her 18 inches deep with her feet up like this. So two weeks later is her birthday. So me and a friend dug her up. She's in a pine box. We put her in her teepee right here and filled the teepee full of cedar, 
wood up from the mountains and torched it. Flames were going up, you know, higher than any of the buildings. Fire department came out. I, I met them at the property edge and said, we're doing a full moon ceremony. It's nothing to worry about. If they came out and seen that there was a woman in a coffin, <laughs> you could actually see you, If you're standing by the fire, I rem I'll never forget this. I even wrote about it. I remember looking. Her, she was, her coffin was on four cedar stumps. And there's the coffin. And the fire is raging. And I looked in after a while. And I could see the silhouette of her rib cage and her heart burning inside her rib cage. And we wondered if, you know, we had done a bad thing or what, but she was buried like this. It felt more like a, a rescue. But the thing that happened that was totally amazing is, like, we started in the evening, and we, get, we torched the fire. The full moon came up over the mountains, and the full sun was setting. So you, you saw the full moon rising, big, big orange-pink circle, and the sun setting, and a storm was coming, so there was heat lightning and flash lightning and wind and swirling wind and a double rainbow. Every phenomena from the sky came to this funeral. So we kind of knew we were doing the right thing. And uh, so anyway, we've had funerals, weddings, and um, it, there's history out there is what I'm saying. It's thick with history. And uh, in all of these compounds, there's stuff. So this is the pyramid. That's kryptonite. And uh, that's the compound back in the old days. No, notice, nothing else is out there. Now there's just all kinds of mobile homes and stuff. We're going to probably wall it all in and fix and bring it back to what it was, get the turbine spinning again, and, and uh, there's the pyramid being built. That's Beth. And we burned her at the pyramid. And there we are building it. There's the double rainbows that happened out there a lot. That's the old compound where earth ships were born. One of the places. And you can imagine those double rainbows with the wind, with the lightning, with the full moon rising, with the full sun setting, and a 50 foot tall bonfire with a woman inside of it. So I started drinking. <laughs> and never stopped. But that's the compound. It's, it, it was amazing out there. It really was. Taos picked up on it a little bit. Uh, hey, they call it a world of his own. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Uh, so the turbine started taking off, so we built the castle around it. And uh, that's the castle, which is the first. That's when we got into two-story space. That's the way it used to look when I was there. Uh, it used to be a jungle in there, and we're going to take it back. Because, I mean, you know, plants... It's, it's interesting, all the different people that have lived in these buildings after I've left, it's like, it kind of reminds me of the earth. They didn't understand the buildings, like people don't understand the earth. So you see, you people that are staying in the castle, you see what this jungle area looks like now. It's a dust bowl with maybe a few plants growing in it. Well, that's the way the earth is headed too, because people don't understand the earth. People that lived in the castle didn't understand the castle. And we're bringing these buildings and this life back and we're doing the same thing, or thinking that we could do the same thing to the planet. Uh, so there's the old dinosphere, we called it. Now this dinosphere out here is modeled after, you know, years of experience. And it, this thing is quiet, and it'll, we know it'll last for 25 years with no maintenance, and we're playing with the right generator for it. We went up in the mountains in that old red truck, got the logs, the trees, logged them out ourselves, pounded all the tires, um, I mean, this is back in the days when I could take one person and, and build a building, you know. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd usually wear one person out and I'd get another one and another one. And, uh, me and one person could build a building because I just kept on going. Uh, that was then. This is now. Um, I had a power center out there. I'll talk more about that in the power part. That's the old castle with the dinosphere on it. And... Uh, that's the compound where a lot of stuff happened. Well, then, uh, it's always, I always relate all of this history to various wives. Uh, finally had the last marriage and last divorce to the oil baroness and got with the one who I'm with now who makes the cookies, which you haven't probably gotten yet, but you will. 
And we needed a home. She had two kids. I had one. And I had to put everything I knew together to try and get us a home. And it became the first earthship. This is the first building called an earthship. It's a bunch of views, logs laying in cross.